Good morning and welcome to uh, Block Bytes. Thank you for joining me, Ulver. Janus from Bitcoin hello, Layers, hello. our special guest today. Janus, I don't know anything about you, dude. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so online, um, I go by Janus. That's how people find me on Twitter, Noster, Farcaster. I am working on a project right now called Bitcoin Layers. Um, we're essentially analyzing a bunch of implementations of L2s and sidechains. Um, on top of or alongside Bitcoin, however you want to frame it. I used to work in like communications and marketing, worked at electric coin company in the Zcash ecosystem, worked at Espresso Systems on a shared sequencer protocol in Ethereum. It's more like philosophically, like I'm really like interested in like, you know, Bitcoin fair launch, like no pre-mine, um, proof of work um, as a consensus mechanism. And I have always been like fascinated with that. And then when the rollups on Bitcoin paper came out and there, there was like sections on, you could potentially do like Zcash style execution environments and you can, you know, have these, have these chains inherit, you know, the full security of the Bitcoin base layer. That's when I got really into like built, like looking and researching these different types of L2 constructs on Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of led me into this position now where I'm, where I'm spending, you know, my entire, like I, I do this full time and I'm just reviewing these various implementations of sidechains, L2s and, and more. You know, this is just a, like a natural extension of your interest in blockchain is this project Bitcoin layers, where you're just going through and reviewing each of these different L2s off of Bitcoin. Awesome, dude. That's perfect. I don't know anything about Bitcoin L2s aside from our sh brief conversations about it. Um, so we're happy to have you here to pick your brain a little bit. Can you explain, uh, like, for for the users who don't know anything, like, what is the Bitcoin layer two, and like, what is uh, the general state of it right now? Yeah, so it it the, the definition is different for everyone. I don't think any of these things, aside maybe from Lightning, are actually layer twos because typically for a layer two, if you're a user, if you deposit your funds into um, this layer two protocol, you have some assurances that you can eventually get them out um, and you have control over your assets, even inside of these layer two protocols. The, the differences with Bitcoin, um, there's some limitations in the scripting language. So um, a lot of these bridges are essentially just multi-sigs that are managed by a federated um, group of signers. So you're trusting when you're depositing funds into these um, sidechain type protocols, you're trusting anywhere from like 10, 11, 12, 15 people to remain honest and not steal the money that you deposit into the protocol. What's happening is there's a lot of these new like type like EVM type chains because there's kind of this, there's been shown there's this demand to transact with Bitcoin on chain through the ordinals craze, BRC 20s, et cetera. So people are now looking at this as an opportunity to like, hey, let's build these like second layers alongside or on top of Bitcoin to make this user experience better. Um, and it's it's that's kind of the thesis behind it. Um, whether that's working out in practice, I'm not entirely sure. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, essentially right now what, what these Bitcoin L2s are, is I would say they're, they're really no different than um, any type of like side chain secured by multi-sig um, with regards to the custody of the assets. And a lot, and I would say over 70 to 80% of them, um, over like overall, over all like Bitcoin scaling protocols, it's like 60, 65% are based on the EVM. But with regards specifically to like side chains and rollups, I think it's like over 70, 80% of these things are just using some version of the EVM. So they're trying to like port over Ethereum like applications. And instead of having ETH be the native currency, they want BTC to be the native currency. Um, so that's kind of like a TLDR on what's going on, and yeah, happy to dive into whatever aspect of that. To yeah, it's more color. Yeah, do you, <laughs> yeah. do you, do you think uh, it's because it's still like very early, so the tech is still developing, or uh, why why is it like this that uh, you kind of have yeah. to trust multi sticks and so on? That's a great question. So, I mean, I, it, again, it's limitations in script. Um, and and the ability to um, just create more expressive bridge programs. There is this desire now to build like newer types of L2s or rollups or whatever you want to call them. Back in I think October of last year, some people figured out how to create more trust minimized bridge programs. Um, it's a pretty technical thing. Don't really need to get into the weeds of it, um, but it showed that these types of more trust minimized bridge programs were possible. And when that happened, I think there was a shift into like oh, wow, we can actually develop like rollups or these Ethereum-like mm -hmm. scaling solutions on top of Bitcoin. 
So a lot of research and a lot of money has been invested um, into teams trying to figure out how to do that. And I, I think there's a lot of different variations of these types of protocols. It's different from project to project, but essentially what teams are trying to do now is work on a new bridge design to create a more trust minimized two-way peg between um, a more trust minimized bridge between the roll-up side chain, whatever, and Bitcoin. Um, but a lot of those, none of none of those systems are in production yet. So today, everything that's launched yeah. is launched before those before those bridge designs have, have gone live. All right. So they're just trusting like traditional like federated multisigs. So do you think they're they're like front running and you know they see that like oh we're gonna get here eventually and now you better you know you better start now so you you know you start with whatever tech you know we have now but then we're developing is that accurate or it's it's a really good it's a really good point because it's kind of the same thing in Ethereum right it's like in Ethereum it's like oh we're gonna launch this L two with this upgradable multi sig this upgradable contract from that's governed by a multi sig oh yeah. The centralized sequencer, centralized prover. We're going to launch without fraud proofs, right? Like this is kind of the story in Ethereum of like progressive decentralization with these rollups, right? And you kind of trust the organizations developing them um, along this like decentralization path. I think in regards to Bitcoin, I don't think that's any different. I think they're just launching as these side chain rollup type blockchains. And then they're like, yeah, we're going to have a multi-sig now and we're going to build a more trust minimized bridge program later. I think some of them are actually trying to launch like so Alpen Labs and Sertreya specifically are trying to launch with more trust minimized bridge programs. Others have decided to go a different route and be in production first and leverage maybe some existing technologies, whether that be like a federated multi-sig protocol. Bob, for example, is launching a roll-up on Ethereum and leveraging a native atomic swap protocol to get users to have their native BTC be swapped into like TBTC. So it's like this different approach of like, hey, we're going to take all these existing technologies. We're going to put them together and create like this better user experience for using Bitcoin-centric applications. And when I say Bitcoin-centric, I mean lowercase b as in like the currency. Then it's like as the research and progress develops on these more like Bitcoin native technologies, we'll then add those on over time. So I'd say like probably the best roadmap, if you look at it, like the most transparent roadmap would be Bob's. And then you have teams like Alpen and Sutrea that are like, no, we're going to launch like as a native Bitcoin rollup using Bitcoin for DA. We're going to build on this trust minimized bridge, et cetera. So it's just different approaches and go to market strategies. So front running is is a way to put it, but um, I, yeah, it's definitely a way to put it. So some teams are, are, are taking that approach because they want to get to market faster and, and attract more users faster. Is this like a change in the Bitcoin culture? Because it has kind of been like, oh, we like Bitcoin the way it is and, you know, don't change anything. Is this a, a difference? Like is something happening there? I don't know if it's 100% like a culture change. I think it's just there's a lot of people that hold Bitcoin and have held Bitcoin for years. I am a very normal Bitcoiner in the sense of the way I use it. I like having a lightning wallet. I like buying stuff on online stores or buying gift cards through BitRefill or buying coffee, whatever. I always was like more just interested in Ethereum as like a technology and being like, oh, they're developing these rollups and they have these like infrastructure protocols look really cool. They're like using ZK tech, like let's look into this, right? This is interesting. And I feel like there's more of a flip side in that where there's a lot of people like in the Ethereum ecosystem that just from a user perspective, just want to like buy NFTs and be a part of like on-chain communities and participate in DAOs. So there's always been this like culture of like doing everything on chain, whether that is the best way to do it is like, a, it's, an, it's a debate. And there was never really any reason to use Bitcoin because there were none of these like native on chain applications, right? There was like no NFT markets. There was no like token trading markets. And even though they existed, right, these things have existed for a long time. Like there just wasn't the same level of attention on them on Bitcoin as they were on like Ethereum and whatever. So people, I think, felt that like there was no reason to use Bitcoin. And then when ordinals popped off and started getting some more attention, I think you definitely saw a shift in not people becoming like new Bitcoiners. I think it was just people who have held Bitcoin for like five, six years or whatever. were just like, oh, I'm going to start using it now because I want to participate in this new like online internet economy maybe that's a culture change right in terms of the people who have held bitcoin for a long time have decided to come back and start using it and make it part of their like on-chain identity it's 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 not been that much of a change in terms of like mm -hmm. the people like myself right like we just 
continue to like use lightning wallets or fediment wallets and buy coffee and whatever i just think there's new opportunities for people who have held bitcoin for a really long time to like come back and start using it on chain the thing i guess we might be trying to get at is that there are kind of like a lot of different tribes of people that use bitcoin like you said like there are guys like you who like to use it transactionally they're at conferences usually when i meet a bitcoin guy it's like an older guy and he's like it's the only real money and it's gold it's the only thing that's worth anything um, and from my experience, those people that kind of tend to view it purely as just like a store of value rather than like a unit of transaction have shown a lot of kind of resistance towards like ordinals, for instance. They show kind of little interest in in ordinals, inscriptions in these L2. So I guess that's kind of like a little bit of a culture clash that we're kind of getting at. I don't know if you've noticed the same thing or maybe that's just my outside perspective. So like when I was going to meetups, like just local Bitcoin meetups and mm -hmm. ordinals was going off and I'm like, like people hate people hated it. They're like, mm -hmm. "What is going on?" Like they're gra putting graffiti on the money. Yeah, and and I I was like, "Well, if you look at the bigger picture, you can use this type of technology to like inscribe like zero knowledge proofs, right? Mm -hmm. And like use that as a as a way to like post a proof of execution for like a roll up state transition onto Bitcoin, right? That's real because that's like super useful, right? So the way that like Satraya, for example is going to be posting sequencer batches and their validity proofs from the prover is the same way that you would basically inscribe an ordinal. You're just putting some data into um, a Bitcoin transaction and putting it onto the Bitcoin main chain. And it's accessible via all the Bitcoin full nodes, right? When I would go to meetups, I would try to explain like, hey, there's some use cases outside of, you know, ordinals and, and kind of these like on-chain like NFT things with this technology, but there is this argument that I've heard from people like in the ordinals community. It's like, hey, like there seems to be when we have like these these crazy waves of like ordinals um, activity, like that's most of the on-chain activity related to Bitcoin. Like there's more transactions on-chain happening with these ordinals transactions versus like people buying their coffee with lightning. Like I, I'm kind of hand waving that and I don't know like the exact data behind it, but that's like the argument. And like, I don't know a ton of people that like go and actively spend their Bitcoin outside of like trading it for stuff on chain. So I, I, I guess I would agree with that, right? Like people sometimes view it as a store of value and they kind of look at all these things as a waste of time. But at the same time, it's a permissionless system. And if people want to use it for that use case, like you can't stop them. People have kind of accepted it at this point. And I think it's a culture and it's another subculture within Bitcoin that's going to, going to be here to stay. I think that would eventually extend into these kind of like L2 systems. There's still, I think there's still some division between like what the L2 ecosystem in Bitcoin is versus the Ordinals ecosystem. I don't think they're completely aligned yet, which is I... I, which I think might be a hot take, but yeah. Love a hot take. Yeah. This is a really handy tool for someone like me who doesn't know almost anything about Bitcoin L2s, like mm -hmm. what the differentiating yeah. factors might be. It's really cool. Um, I've been using this for my yeah. research. I appreciate that. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. I think you mentioned, you know, Lightning is like the only one you consider to be a true L2. It says so here with the risks you've outlined for it, but mm -hmm. I guess just like a quick walkthrough of the site. Um, You know, you have all the L2s here. Their types, status, unit of account, Bitcoin, locked. Yeah. But the most important thing to meet here for me is the risks, right? Or you've kind of outlined bridge risk, data risk, operator risk, and settlement assurance. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is great, dude. This is really interesting stuff. I, I see like Bob's probably actually the best one. So we're we're basically looking at four things, right? We're we're looking at who custodies the funds when you deposit them into the the side chain or L2. Where is the data with regards to the state of the L2 being stored and who makes it available, who's operating the network. And then obviously is the transaction ultimately settled on Bitcoin. So I think like Bob, for example, you're you're trusting the Bob like native bridge and you're trusting the, the multi-sig that governs that, that aspect of the protocol. You're trusting a multi-sig that's um, basically managing the TBTC that's minted on Bob. That's a three of five mm -hmm. multi-sig, which can be- So with that- um... yeah. Would that be similar to wrap, wrap Bitcoin or like what's the analogy? That's a great question. So wrap Bitcoin, like on Bob, for example, right? Um, it's being issued by by BitGo. Um, so it's the the main WBTC on Ethereum, which is managed by a custodian. TBTC is a bit different because it's managed by essentially a very like large multi-sig. But in any sense in Bob, you're when you're interacting with either of these synthetics, you're trusting like a number of different parties to not essentially rub you and the reason why a lot of people will trust this is because there's a lot of reputation at stake. Bob has a reputation to like not rug 
the the native bridge. You have TBTC like Bitgo. I mean, TBTC's threshold network. So that's like a little bit more decentralized, right? So even if like the three or five multi-sig becomes corrupt, that can then fall back to threshold governance, which is like a larger, more decentralized network of signers and decentralized network of governance. And then you have obviously WBTC, which is very widely used on Ethereum and has been for years. So it's just trusting like various mechanisms um, and various like synthetic versions of Bitcoin when you're interacting with the protocol. This is like the main risk, right? I wish we, we could figure out from a product perspective, and we, this is probably something we need to do, is basically highlight this aspect of like, if this is the main risk related to any of these protocols, because ultimately in some sense, if something failed, you would still want to be able to exit and just use a Bitcoin L1 transaction um, to get out of the L2. This is definitely the biggest risk related to any of these protocols that people interact with. It's the bridge custody risk. I think uh, for people that have been involved in crypto for a while, I think they're uncomfortably familiar with the concept of bridge like risk, various bridge collapses, bridge failures. It is interesting because how most of these things market themselves or how Bitcoin L2s have always marketed themselves to me is like the the security of Bitcoin inherently, right? Which is uh, not necessarily true for any of these from what you're describing just because of that bridge risk involved, right? I would say Lightning is like probably the example of like enlightening your your depositing funds with like a specific counterparty so you guys can like close the channel collaboratively and if someone tries to act maliciously if you're online you can initiate like a challenge transaction so that's probably like the best form of like multi-sig risk today because it's still a multi-sig you're just you're just depositing it with like someone that like you're depositing it collaboratively with someone else with, with regards to the other protocols, right? Like it's all like, whether it's TBTC, whether it's CKPT, CKBTC on the, on the I, ICP protocol, whether it's WBTC on Ethereum or any version like BitLayer, for example, has an MPC protocol that's custodying the funds in the BitLayer um, sidechain. With any of these protocols, like that's the main risk. You're trusting the majority of them like to not collude and steal the funds. Now, are you affiliated with BitLayer at all? We're not affiliated with uh, any of these projects. Um, we okay. we have an advisory board where members of our advisory board are, some of them are co-founders for some of the projects listed mm -hmm. here. And we have some some advisors as well who work at some of the projects that are listed on the site. But my, myself and my, my co-founder, neither of us, like we're the only ones that are working on this full time and neither of us are affiliated with any of these projects in, in any way. Maybe we can talk about like the tech. What do you say is the Bitcoin tech that is like sort of like promised to be delivered or what is the main thing behind it? Where, where do you see, where, what are they building towards that? You're, you, I think you mentioned uh, BitVM, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk a bit about that. I candidly like don't really know how BitVM works. Like I think from a high level perspective, I understand that it's a way to create like a trust minimized bridge program where you have, let's say you have like 20 operators and they're the ones that are like managing the funds. And then you have the ability for anybody with some form of collateral to act as like a verifier, right? So as long as they can submit a challenge transaction, they can act as like a watchtower over the bridge. So if the current operator managing deposits and withdrawals is acting maliciously and tries to do like a malicious peg out transaction from the bridge and steal funds, then the verifiers that are online can like challenge that. And then if they win the challenge, then the operator I think would get kicked out. Like, please, if you listen to that and you're not entirely sure, go read the, the BitVM2 website because that's going to be the source of truth. Let's say that like that's the model, right? Like, because I'm pretty, pretty confident that that's kind of the idea they're working towards. Is anyone acting as like a verifier over this like bridge program? That is much better than like the current state of trusting a federated like multi-sig, right? And even if the multi-sig is like, you know, has really responsible signers and has like good hardware behind it and like is really trusted by the community, like having the ability to challenge malicious operators is always going to be better than not. So I would say that that was the moment when people figured out that something like that was possible. That was the moment when all of, I would say, these L2 teams, and I think we also need to clarify that the, the BitVM project, the, the team leading it is actually building, is actually working towards another L2 design called ZK Coins, which is distinctly different it's a it's a client side validated protocol specifically used for like really private payments and 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 offering higher throughput 
And that is specifically different than trying to build like a roll-up type construction. So I would say that all the teams that are building roll-ups and these roll-up type L2s with the BitVM style bridge on their roadmap, they might be you know, contributing to BitVM, they might be benefiting from the research, but I would say they're not, they're not like the same projects, right? They're, they are distinct. And these, these projects are, are just various different, you know, projects backed by different investors and will all have, you know, different success levels. But I think that moment of having like a more trust minimized bridge program is what inspired a lot of the capital being, being put into the space. Like before BitVM, you had chain, like you had Celestia, the roll kit team and Celestia figured out how to do like sovereign rollups on Bitcoin. And then you had Chainway, which is building what is now called Citrea. They were building a sovereign rollup. I think you had Alpen Labs still in stealth. Bison Labs, I think, was active. And I think that was really it. When I first started like covering rollups on Bitcoin and different types of L2s, there were only four teams actually like doing this. And there were some like testnet implementations, like Lambda class had a testnet, testnet. Some some people working in in Starknet had had a testnet going, but like it was it wasn't anything like official. And then like the minute that people were like, oh, we can build like trust minimized bridges and have rollups like we do on Ethereum, then it was like let's throw a ton of money at this, and that's when all the development interest started. Yeah, there there is a lot of money moving into this space, right? I don't know if it's like a billion or maybe we could look at uh, the DeFi Llama link of the since uh yeah there's a lot of chains right now i mean there's 17 there but i think there are a lot of them coming up as well maybe some aren't even listed there there is like capital being thrown at this and it's like hundreds of millions of dollars it's it's quite insane like there there's a lot of interest and i think the the, the moment for me like people would like always make fun of me like i remember i was doing my interviews like at espresso and I like told them like during my interview, like, oh, I want to like figure out how you could potentially use something like this in Bitcoin one day, right? Like how can we decentralize the sequencer and provide better interoperability for like Bitcoin rollups? And they looked at me like I was crazy, right? People thought I was nuts, like in the Ethereum space when I would talk about this stuff for, for, quite, for quite a while, right? And then when the moment for me, like it wasn't even the money going into it. It wasn't the money. It wasn't the investors. It wasn't the hype. It was when like Ethereum researchers, like really respected researchers would DM me and be like, what's going on? Is this stuff legit? Like, can you like introduce me to some people? Like when that started happening and more people from kind of the Ethereum side of the world were starting to pay attention and not pay attention in like a skeptical way, pay attention in a way that was like genuinely interested. For me, that's when, that's when I, that's when I felt like a huge culture like mentally like a culture change and someone who i have to give like a ton of credit to as well big shout out to him his name's karsten he works on cartesi and he was one of like the earliest contributors to bitvm working at a very prominent project in ethereum and then saw like this bitvm thing and i think he was like one of the first people that was able to like really figure out how this could potentially work in terms of like a roll-up outside of like the original bitvm team I was very fortunate to like be able to know him and like be able to talk to him and like bounce out bounce ideas and he instilled like a lot of confidence in the idea and i remember just asking him one day i was like is this gonna work and he was like yeah this is gonna work this is gonna be a thing like we're gonna have like these roll-up style blockchains on bitcoin one day because of the system and and since then right there's been a lot of debate on whether this is actually practical or whatever that's again like i mentioned earlier a little bit above my head a little bit above my pay grade um and we'll listen to like the smarter researchers on that but I'm just very excited that that was like the moment that 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 instilled like a lot of optimism in this space. And I, I think it's going to be one of like the defining moments in like Bitcoin's history. I think it was a really, really important shift in the way that people are viewing Bitcoin scaling. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening now. It's it's um, I mean, we see a lot of developments. We've been watching over this uh, yeah. space a bit yeah. and it's exciting. It's it's really cool. I mean, because I like technology and Bitcoin is becoming even better. Yeah, it's like outside, right? Like there's also these other um, proposals as well to potentially introduce other types of scripting capabilities in Bitcoin. And I think that's like another design space that is interesting to follow as well. So yeah, I think it's it's a really exciting time and, and we follow it, right? Our project, we follow all these discussions and are interested in it. But our main focus still is like a lot of these L2 type things are launching with kind of the language of the they're already there right we already mm -hmm. have all these trust minimized capabilities 
So I feel like it's important to provide that like check against check against it a bit and just then tell users, um, ecosystem participants, like, hey, these are these are these are the current state of these things. And, and as they evolve, we obviously document that and, and keep that up to date. I think Bob's like a great example right now. We have like for their settlement assurance is like high risk because they launched without fraud proofs. But I think they're adding fraud proofs within like the next two weeks. That's an improvement in like the overall security of the system, which is really cool. So, right. It's get really also it's a lot of fun to document the journey of a lot of these protocols from a from a risk perspective as well. Yeah, I think that's an extremely valuable uh, public service to kind of discern like the truth from the marketing. Right. Because there's always that like disjointedness. But then there is also that fun aspect of, yeah, documenting the kind of development of these products in public um, in this collective space. We used to do something kind of similar like that when I got into crypto, just running like a little knowledge type news site. It's kind of fun the backlog you build. You kind of kind of see like how far we've come really. Yeah. By highlighting these things publicly and making this information so easily discoverable, you kind of put pressure on these teams, right, to kind of prioritize some of these issues especially like ones that are a little bit more critical because it's kind of easy in the prioritization of development to focus more on like the marketable stuff, right? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. We are actually developing like a, a decentralization framework mm -hmm. for, for side, side chain specific protocols. A lot of people like reach out to us and, and ask for like our opinions on things and, and we'll give them like, and in like an, in an unofficial way, but like, developing that type of framework could be really interesting. I don't want to say it would put pressure on teams, but it would give teams like a North star, right? Like, Hey, this mm -hmm. is like a way that we could potentially design our protocol one day. If we have all of these like trust assumptions in order, and like, we could consider ourselves like, and how, how an L2, L2, L2B does it, they have like stage two rollups, right? And like, for us, it could be like stage two side chains or whatever. That would be a really interesting thing to work on and provide guidance. But ultimately, right? Like, I think the people developing these protocols are very smart and will ultimately be the ones that figure out how to make these systems more decentralized. But like you mentioned, having just something that people kind of go to as a resource is helpful as well, because we can we can hold teams accountable in the event that they're not doing those things, right? Like if a team always stays centralized and always has a centralized multi-sig and centralized network operators, like we'll always say that. We do highlight like research areas and decent like research areas related to decentralization in the assessment just to show people that like, hey, like a lot of these teams are on a journey right now, but at the same time, right, the meat of it is that risk analysis where we're saying like, these are the trust assumptions related to the protocol. I think creating something that like that would be really cool. And we get a lot of, you know, support from the teams, right? Like they all, they provide feedback on our frameworks and a lot of people in the ecosystem do as well, like, like, like just ecosystem contributors and, and open source contributors will like comment and leave feedback on our various frameworks, which helps us finalize them and, and agree upon like standards that we want to like hold these teams against, which is, which is super fun. I guess I'm also curious about Babylon since I think that's a big part of this. Uh, oh yeah. Bitcoin, Bitcoin ecosystem. What is Babylon? Can you explain that? Um, my understanding is that it's a, it's going to be a, a staking protocol that allows people to stake Bitcoin. And I think it's specifically for Comet BFT blockchains. I think it's specifically for providing extra security for, for chains in the Tendermint ecosystem. That was my original understanding of it, but candidly, like haven't followed the developments. I know they raised a ton of money, but again, like some super smart people backing the team and advising that team. And obviously the founders are, are really, really smart as well. So I think like Mezzo, are you guys familiar with Mezzo? No. I am not. Yeah, it's a, it's, they're gonna, they're from the, like TB, like the threshold team thesis is like the, the parent company that's like developed threshold TBTC and some of these other um, protocols. And they're, de they're developing this new like side chain called Mezzo and the security model is going to be dual token staking. So they'll have like their own native token and then they'll have Bitcoin staking. And this is all from like, you can go read their like introductory blog posts where I think they kind of describe this. I think they're going to be leveraging Babylon to, to support on the staking side. I don't know for sure, but like I, I sent a tweet out once, like I, like right after they launched and that was like my my guess. So that would be like a use case, right? Providing providing the ability for people to stake Bitcoin and provide security for like a sidechain protocol. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I really like Bitcoin and I like holding it, but I also like yield. Uh, like I'm used to DeFi and stuff. So I'm kind of used to like, if you have an asset, then you earn a yield on it. But it's kind of difficult with Bitcoin. 
So I think uh, that could be like a really big thing. Like if you can earn like an actual real yield out of it, that that would make the asset like even even stronger. And obviously, like if you could do that in a secure way, yeah, that is like long term sustainable. I think that would really help. Yeah, and a great a great post on this, right? Kind of thinking through this is Jameson Lop wrote a post on the spider chain, and the spider chain is going to be a proof of stake consensus mechanism used in in Botanix's new new sidechain protocol. And my understanding is that a subset of like the people participating in this will be able to stake Bitcoin. And if they're staking Bitcoin, they'll be able to either, yeah, earn transaction fees or they'll be able to earn some type of reward for being in the protocol. My understanding is that the, the spider chain team is just going to be doing transaction fees. But then you have other protocols that will implement this like dual token staking mechanism where you'll stake Bitcoin and then you'll earn um, issuance for this like new token that they issue to incentivize like you staking. So yeah, I, I think those those models are coming. It's it's going to be the wild west. So I y- you don't know how all of this is going to turn out. <laughs> Kudos to the brave few that that take on the risk early. But I think that we're we're in the very early stages, and a lot of those protocols are being developed. And I think we already have like liquid staking tokens and all this crazy stuff that, that that's happening on Ethereum. It's now all coming over to Bitcoin. So like any type of like infra project you can think of in Ethereum, it will exist in bitcoin in some form or fashion within like the next year or two now what does it have the same trust assumptions that's a completely different conversation but those styles of protocols are coming um and and aiming to be as bitcoin aligned as possible so i guess that kind of like dovetails into what the state of bitcoin DeFi is right now do you see a lot of opportunity or is it still too early i test all these protocols Mm -hmm. just to like use them so i'll move like a hundred couple hundred bucks right Mm -hmm. and they all have evm bridges too so you can have like a couple hundred bucks like wtc wbtc on arbitrum and then they'll connect to some bridge where you can like transfer it over to like bitlayer or b squared network or any of these new type new types of products coming out i have to be honest like a lot of the information on who's managing these multi-sigs and who's responsible for the custody of the assets is is not live. Like I think BitLayer's done a pretty decent job of outlining the trust assumptions. Bob has like an entire page dedicated to that. But like a lot of these new sidechain protocols, like if you're just like a normal user, and and when I say normal user, you're just someone who just doesn't read about this stuff all day. Like you're just not spending eight hours reading about Bitcoin L2s and sidechains. I, I think it's going to be really hard to find the information on who's securing um, the assets within these various protocols. So my opinion right now is in what, like, again, this is not advice. I would probably advise against interacting with a lot of this stuff right now, just because it's, it's so it's that early where I feel Mm. like there is a lot of risk and I think there will probably be rugs. I have another website called Bitcoin tokens.wtf and that's outlining like which projects in Bitcoin have launched tokens and which ones have done rug pulls. And I think I've found like four or five have already done rug pulls. The reason why this is kind of scary is that there's so much like, and this is just like a simple notion site to just kind of mm-hmm. show what's going on. But the reason that this is like kind of scary is that a lot of these projects, like ZK Sats is a, is a great example. Like it's my intuition that they have rug pulled and that they were accepting deposits for like an extended window of time in promise for these tokens that they gave people. And then they like just completely ran away with everyone's deposits and the tokens mm-hmm. like, I don't know if they even exist. I don't know if they're worth anything, if there is even a blockchain. The website's offline, like everything's offline now. Wow. And the reason that's kind of scary is because like that specific project is like when you see all these like L2 ecosystem roadmaps and list websites or whatever, like it's on all those sites. It's still like there was a new list like posted on Twitter that gets a bunch of like shares and follows. And it gets hyped up by like big people in the ecosystem and it's still on there. And it's like, I'm like, guys, this like, it's a rug pull, right? <laughs> like we can't, mm-hmm. like, I, I understand like oh, if you no. posted it before and you didn't know, but like after it rugs, like you probably should take it off the list, right? I'd say right now it's just, it's too early. Like a lot of the projects that got to market, if you look at kind of the validator sets and you look at the people managing the protocol, everything's permissioned other than like maybe something like stacks or rootstock where like 
everything right now with regards to like these Bitcoin L2s is every every like party managing the network is a permissioned operator. I would just tell everyone to like exercise caution with these things. And I, I use them all the time and like they work and like you can do transactions and you can do withdrawals and stuff like that. But like, I don't know if like the person managing the withdrawals is just like running a spreadsheet on like Google Sheets in the background. I don't know how it actually works because there's just not a lot of information that's listed on how a lot of these things work right now. That would be kind of my answer right now. I think there are some cool stuff. Like I think Bob's doing like an interesting like go to market. It's like also list. it's an Ethereum project. So it's also listed on L2 beat. So you can look at our site for like the Bitcoin perspective. And then you can look at L2 beat for the Ethereum perspective on Bob. And it outlines all the risks. And if like you're a user and you read that and you're okay with taking on all these risks, like there's a ton of apps that you can use that allow you to do all this crazy DeFi stuff with Bitcoin backed tokens. But yeah, I would say mm -hmm. for, for the large majority, it's it's still, it's, I mean, even for things like Bob, right, there's still a ton of risk associated with, with it. So I would just tell everyone like, yeah, exercise caution with this stuff. And, and yeah, yeah absolutely. use lightning. <laughs> use lightning is uh, my biggest recommendation. Okay. Uh, I've been looking into the DeFi uh, so far, and what I can see is a lot of the times someone is like depositing like, you know, 300 million Bitcoin, but then there's like no no actual usage of the apps, like no one is borrowing. So there's mm -hmm. like no yield uh, except for like incentives. So it seems like currently there's not a lot of like organic use uh is that your impression as well yeah 100 percent, right like when i when i use this stuff like if you go to like the leaderboards on some of these projects like they have like app leaderboards where i think they're trying to like incentivize developers to deploy with like points systems i guess is what they're called and yeah i was like the first person i think to ever act as like an lp or something <laughs> i was like the first person to ever use it um, for like specific like um, trading pairs and and provide liquidity. So I, I think for a lot of these projects, there's there's two sides of it. It's either like I'd say fake, right? In a way that like these projects are just like pumping up their own TVL metrics by getting people to deposit funds and make it look good on like DeFi Llama, or it's like people are actually just depositing a boatload of assets into the bridge program to earn the native token airdrop. Um, but aren't actually using the protocol. I think those are like the two situations that are happening. Because if you look at most of like the block explorers and you look at most of the activity on these things, it's it's kind of a ghost town um, for most of the apps. Mm -hmm. I think there's some stuff that's pretty useful. Um, again, like that's like we're, we are in the earliest of earliest of days with regards to like how these things will play out. And I, I don't think that in two years, I I highly doubt that most of these projects will have any sort of like, and not not just not the stuff necessarily listed on our, I mean, our site included, but like, there's probably like 70 or 80 projects floating around that call themselves Bitcoin L2s. And I think maybe like, three or four of them will actually like exist in like two or three years time. Yeah, it's the the early like Cambrian explosion on Bitcoin right now, right? Lots yeah. of things that are going to dead end, not work out, just be completely fails from the start so the highest highest risk time to be involved right yeah it's weird because like it's high risk in the sense but like these people have no incentive to rug you because like there's no right like the incentive to like do the rug pulls and like steal all the money is when these things actually get a lot bigger and like a ton of people that's why like a lot of the rug pulls i've seen were so interesting because like they were stealing user deposits but like you look at and you have to like follow a paper trail, but it couldn't have been that much money, right? Like you look at the, the the tweets regarding it, you can't really find the transaction activity, but you kind of see like the mentions on Twitter and you kind of look at the press and you see all the stuff related to the specific protocol. You can't, I can't imagine these being like super high value theft, like heists, right? But I think when the space gets a little more legitimacy and more activity, I think is when most of the, the higher value like rug pulls will happen. Like right now it's more of like, People don't have necessarily the skill or there's not enough hype yet. So they're kind of just trying things out. But like you said, yeah, once they have some success and there's some use, then you're going to get the rug pills and the the beautifully complex Ponzi's that we know and love. The issue, I think, as well, is that like a lot of these things, right? What is a Ponzi, right? Like what's mm -hmm. a Ponzi? I think this is all relative, right? Like if you talk to like kind of myself, like I 
kind of would stay away from all tokens related to L2s and governance tokens and stuff like that. I, I don't think necessarily the applications themselves are always bad, but I think a lot of like the backstory with regards to like investor allocations and the way these things are going to be distributed aren't always the greatest. A lot of people will go like, oh no, governance tokens are really important because they're a way for like us to do like on-chain signaling or on-chain voting or whatever, and that's how we do it. And it's an incentivization mechanism. That's cool. And then you have like, I guess, people that are like all the tokens, right? Like let's do everything. And then you have like, again, the hardcore maximalist types that are just like, it's all shit coins. I guess my kind of greatest fear is that people do look at Bitcoin as this very kind of legitimate thing, maybe from the outside. I think people people view like Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum as like these legitimate things in this crazy, crazy world. And I feel like if you're able to like advertise yourself as like a Bitcoin adjacent, Bitcoin secure project, and that gets people to deposit funds into it. And then you end up stealing, like that's kind of, I think that's where my head kind of gets really worried. And I don't think that's happened yet. I don't think anybody on like watching NBC on Saturday at 2 p.m. who's never like done an on-chain transaction. I don't think right there right now using Bitcoin L2s, I think the people using them are just like playing the degeneracy games and like, you know, mm -hmm. you're getting into. I, I do think there's a world where like activity comes on chain it comes through various mechanisms. And if there is a Bitcoin aspect of that and people trust it because it's Bitcoin, that gets really scary because people, it's, you're kind of like affinity scamming, right? Like you're saying yeah. you're Bitcoin adjacent and then you're just using that to like either kind of take advantage of users. Um, maybe you're running like a federated network where you're just extracting like a ton of MEV or maybe you just straight up like steal, steal from people. Like those are the kind of the worlds where, where my head kind of goes and I'm like, yeah, that's not, not probably the best. In like the general culture, Bitcoin has probably the most sterling reputation of all cryptocurrencies is like the most legitimate, the most secure. Um, so there is like a lot of reputational risk if these bad actors were to leverage that that reputation. If I was an evil guy, that's what I would do. I'd be like, oh, of course I'm safe. I'm on Bitcoin, dude. I don't know if it's bad actors or just like experiments gone wrong or Ponzi mm -hmm. schemes gone wrong or design mechanisms gone wrong. I, I mean, I think there are projects they're going to launch. They're going to try to do good things. And I think they're just going to fail. I think some will succeed. And I think we'll, I think some are just like kind of outright malicious or yeah, maybe just don't care. Um, a little uh, incompetent or flippant maybe yeah i don't i don't know like because i mean like even even for the stuff that i would consider like like completely like a centralized scam like i know like they're they're really smart people working in all these things right like so i don't know if malicious is the right word or maybe just like there's not an incentive to actually develop like a sound protocol when everyone's just kind of launching these centralized chains the the, the problem with the space is that like what you mentioned, what you mentioned earlier is right. Like we are front running the the technology and we are kind of front running the game a little bit. And I think hopefully that doesn't result anything like super catastrophic, but like if the tech doesn't come like this wave of like new chains and, and marketing and, and legitimacy, like, I think it's going to get way worse and like, it's pretty bad now, but like in 12 months, I think it's going to be a lot worse, especially if the prices of Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, like if the greater market continue to trend upward, I know they've retraced a little bit, but like if they continue to trend upward and there's more money to give out, then that's where I get really worried. And like, if the technology is not ready, right, then you have just complete, just like games going on. Like there, there are projects launching already that are like launch your own Bitcoin L2 for like 50 bucks. And it's, it's not a Bitcoin L2, but like, if you can build like ecosystems of these things and you can do like these crowd token sales and all this, all this, all this stuff, right? Like, I, I think that's where it gets a little bit scary because we are definitely front running the tech and we are putting ourselves in a position where we're trusting very, very centralized parties with the custody of a lot of money. No, I mean, it's a frightening thought. It makes kind of what your project does even more valuable, right? Because you're allowing that or, or you're creating that distinction for people more clearly, right? Like what this is and what this isn't. Uh, which may help mitigate some of the damage <laughs> that will be inevitable when things grow, right? Here's a great example, Fedimints. Fedimints are a great example. Are you guys familiar with what Fedimints are? Fedimints? No, it sounds uh, like a tasty treat though. Yeah, so Fedimints are this thing, um, hand-waving again, like they're, they're essentially modules to build federated um, applications. And what I mean by federated is that you trust like community custody is like a, a use case they talk about. And it's like, hey, let's create this mechanism where we have people deposit money into this essentially multi-sig 
but it's of people that they know. It's like, hey, I'm going to deposit my funds into a multi-sig, but I know the six signers who are managing all the money personally because they live down the street from me. And if they stole from me, then like I can go like find them and like, you know, beat them up or whatever because they stole from me, right? There's like yeah. community risk and like personal risk involved in this. And that was like the original idea behind this. And that's extended to right, like federations of like, like a group of people that run maybe like a Bitcoin conference and they have like reputational risk in the ecosystem to not rug people because they have this conference and that's their business model. They'll run a Fediment and you can maybe if you wanted to use a Fediment wallet instead of a self-custodial lightning wallet, because it's a little bit easier, you can then trust that those people running the conference won't rug you because they have reputational risk. Very similar to like any multi-sig scheme. For me, I like when I was recently in Prague at like a, at a Bitcoin coffee shop called Paralonipolis, like instead of downloading, you know, a lightning wallet and moving some funds into that, I just was like, I'll just use a Fediment wallet. And then when I was onboarding, I picked a Fediment based on a review that someone I knew online left the federation. They're like, this is a good federation. I know the signers, they're cool. Money's good here. And that's why I picked it. Right. So like, even in my like personal life, I'll still use some of these applications that take on like a lot of custodial risk. And I, like, if someone asked me, like, should I use a Fediman? I'm like, don't put more than like 50 bucks in it. But yeah, like, why not for like really small payments? And I think a lot of these L2s or side chains might fall within that category. They might just be like, for example, like I've tested Bob. It seems cool. Like I know the team. I don't think they're going to rub people. I think they're doing things the right way with regards to their own go to market strategy. The reason we have the generalized framework is that we can showcase things independent of like personal opinions, like the, the custody related to Bitcoin on Bob is, is a very high risk. So like, even though I can trust it and I feel like it's something that I can use with like small amounts of Bitcoin or small amounts of anything, mm -hmm. right? Like we still need to have the general framework of saying like, Hey, this is all like a high risk, right? And, and just like day to day stuff, right? Th there are tons of use cases where people are going to interact with custodial or federated applications in Bitcoin. And I think just clearly outlining the assumptions related to all these things and kind of saying like, hey, don't put more money than you can afford to lose into this because like there is a chance that something bad and it couldn't even be like malicious. Like there's a chance that something could just go wrong due to a number of reasons. Right. So I feel like that's kind of the the way I would approach this stuff. But that's why in the in the website, we don't offer recommendations. We don't offer opinions. We just say, hey, this is the trust assumption and this is what you're taking on. And I don't think people should ever look at our website as a as a way to justify their decision to use a protocol or not. I think that's probably the wrong way because uh, the wrong way to look at it because there's risks and trade offs associated with all of this stuff. So like you're providing just the labels less so than the recommendations, right? Like, what is this as opposed to is this for me or not? Yeah. Like, I and I think that's. Yeah, like that's like with Liquid, right? Like Liquid is 15 person multi-sig custodying the funds that are used to mint LBTC on Liquid. But people trust Liquid because it's built by Blockstream and it has a lot of reputational backing specifically within the Bitcoin ecosystem. And that's totally fine. But like, and that's great that you can trust it. And I'm glad that you can. But at the end of the day, it's still multi-sig and like we still have to clarify that. So there's a, there's a lot of situations like that where I think users just have to ultimately like do a ton of research, even past our site to like learn who the signers are and who the parties are within these various systems and what is the various security mechanisms they have in place. And unfortunately it is pretty hard to decipher. So I'd say like, like, like what you mentioned earlier, is it kind of the very riskiest of times? I don't know if it's the riskiest of where it's going to be like in the next two years, but it's definitely a pretty high risk time. I would say not the riskiest, but still very risky. Maybe. I appreciate it so much, Giannis. I appreciate you being here and this chat with you. Unfortunately, I've got to wrap it up here, but we should have you back, man. This was a really great conversation over probably more experience with what's going on in Bitcoin than I am, but I would say we're both probably total noobs. So it was great to talk with a freaking OG like you, dude. We learned so much. Yeah, yeah. really cool yeah. to see what's going on here. Thank you so much. And I would say, hey, like it's I know this was like kind of a doom and gloom episode, maybe kind of like bringing it back. <laughs> I don't know about that. But it is a really it is a really cool time. Like I mentioned, a lot of people are interested in this space and it's going to be it's going to be fun over the next uh, the next few years figuring it all out. But yeah, I would just say everyone do your own research yeah. and, and understand there's a lot of risk with interacting with these things right now. Hell yeah. A lot of energy going to Bitcoin right now. And uh, we're going to throw some in behind it, too, I think. So thank you so much, Yonas. I appreciate it. Thank you, Olver. And thank you for everybody watching this. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>
See you.